Hello and welcome to episode 35 of Webflow, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the greatest failures behind the greatest webflowers, because success often comes after learning from many failures. I'm your host, Jack, a failure connoisseur, and today my guest is Connor Finlayson. You've probably already heard of Connor. If you're listening to this podcast, it's all about Webflow freelancing. I'm sure you know him, but for those who haven't, Connor is a no-code weapon. On his YouTube channel with over 11K subs, he helps people who cannot code build their own online businesses with no-code tools like Webflow, Airtable, and Zapier. You've probably heard that intro before, guys. Uh, Connor comes from a marketing background and then came across Webflow, uh, which helped him spin up landing pages fast. He wanted to get more freelance work, so instead of building a portfolio website, he built a directory for freelancers and put himself at the top. Genius. We're going to get into that. He then built this into the Unicorn Factory, a job board for New Zealand-based freelancers, and now it's his main source of income, and he no longer freelances. So in the words of Connor, without further ado, let's get into it. Connor, welcome to Webflow. Great intro. I even love the let's get into it. <laughs> That's yeah. a fine touch right there. Hey, hey, for those that watch your videos, they will recognize, recognize that <laughs> phrase. You do it so oh, fast funny. in your videos. You're just like on autopilot when you're doing your intros now. Um, yeah. But no, it's it's epic to to finally have you live in front of me rather than watching your videos, which I've been doing all day. Um, it's great to have you here. So yeah. I wanted to ask you first off, this is a question from Emily Giordano. How was the Unicorn Factory event? Yeah. Um, so I just got back from New Zealand. I spent a month over there. Um, I live in Canada now. So um, it was my first trip back to New Zealand. And one of the freelancers on the Unicorn Factory found out I was coming back to New Zealand. So they decided to um, host a meetup. And it was awesome. Um, like 70 people showed up and um, wow. we did like a little panel Q&A thing. There were some of the other freelancers on there that were basically sharing their experiences as well. But it was awesome. Um, I think the, the thing that, was, that I really enjoyed about the most was that I got to meet a whole bunch of the freelancers that had joined the site since I moved to Canada in person. And it was cool. Like you recognize them from their profile photos and stuff like that. And so... It was just awesome, like being able to connect with people like that. It really got me in the mood for like networking again, because uh, ever since you know all of the lockdowns and stuff, I've kind of just like you know do a lot of my networking online. But just having gone to that Unicorn Factory event kind of really showed why it's actually awesome to go and do more in person things. So it was fantastic, and it's so cool that they organized that for you, or someone found out that you were going to be there, and they were like oh my god, all Unicorn Factory people unite. Like that is a serious fan base and community that you've you've built up over time. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm very lucky. We've got like a really great community of freelancers. And um, yeah, I mean, um, it, 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 I was definitely like stoked by it. Like uh, it was, it's, it's really, um, it kind of, it's really good, especially when you're like working on a business yourself to kind of, you know, you always get, some kind of feedback, positive, negative, but like, um, I I organized the Webflow meetup in um in Wellington back in the day, and it was because I loved the platform so much, and because I got so much value out of it. So, for now, someone to organize a meetup around something that I created was really cool. It felt really good, and so yeah, very lucky to have like great people on the site. That is mental. You've built not just fans but super fans and i think that is something that i think companies generally like don't really develop nearly as much as personas um i definitely think webflow has has managed it in in a pretty magical way but um yeah it's it's amazing that you've managed to develop that kind of around you and sharing the unicorn factory but one thing i wanted to ask you about so i've been digging into your videos today and you obviously share all about no-code tools, but in the context a lot of the time in how it's affected the Unicorn Factory. And I came across a video where someone had literally ripped off your whole concept. And mm -hmm. I just want to ask you about that, like the tension between sharing so much of what you're doing and teaching people and, you know, inspiring people, but then also 
kind of giving away your secret sauce like do you feel like there's a line there do you regret sharing as much as you have can you talk to us a little bit about that mm. so that video wasn't necessarily about someone like ripping off the unicorn factory or copying it it was about them it was a freelance on the unicorn factory that managed to take advantage of some issues with the no code tools that i was using to get access to all of the freelancers email addresses on the unicorn factory and they then built their platform and then um basically emailed all of them and so that was kind of what the issue was um i, I fundamentally don't really have an issue with people copying um like the unicorn factory or other kind of projects that i work on for that matter because i do believe that um everything that we work on is an abstraction of something that we've experienced. And me, for example, I've never made a secret of it that Webflow Experts was one of like the main influences for me to build the Unicorn Factory. And um, they shared how they built it in their blog post. And so um, there are a few reasons why I decided to share all of this stuff. Number one is I always kind of think back to the less competent version of myself and where I was stuck in the process of building my own site and the value that I got from reading that blog post that a Webflow put out about how they created Webflow experts. And so when I started sharing it with people, um, it was mostly because I thought, you know, it's a great way to kind of pay it back or pay it forward for the kind of, you know, resources that other people have shared. Because not just um, have I, have I um, you know, shared some of the things that I've done with the Unicorn Factory, but I've actually mostly learned way, way more from other people in the community. I remember like really getting the hang of Webflow by watching all of Nelson's tutorials. Um, I watched a lot of Aaron's tutorials to get the hang of Airtable. And besides just like the content that people put out, it's also the people who like give me their time to like jump on a call with me and explain to me how to do certain things. And so I think the key thing to make um, it, to, you know, to like really make sure that you're like a good part of the community is to like give back what you get from others and so ultimately you know if someone um, gets inspired by the unicorn factory finds my youtube channel and they want to build their own um freelancer marketplace um i'm more than happy for people to do so if i wasn't i wouldn't share the content and also you know like i'm if someone does build something like the unicorn factory and they managed to overtake me, then it wouldn't have had anything to do with the no code tools or the things that I share. There are a lot of things that happen behind the scene that you just kind of figure out through trial and error over time. And so I always understand that they uh, will have to go through that process themselves. And so overall, I'm not particularly worried about it, but I also kind of do encourage people to like go out and like try build things themselves. And that's ultimately why I created the channel. That's an awesome answer. I feel like uh, a lot of people get it inside in their head that they're just like, this is my secret sauce. I can't share this. But actually, like a lot of famous chefs, you know, they have become famous through sharing what they do. And, and ultimately, there's a lot of things that you might share. But behind the scenes, like you say, there's so much that goes into making something as complex as the Unicorn Factory. And uh, yeah, I can't imagine anyone copying it or surpassing it to such an extent that 70 people would organize an event on their behalf. So yeah, I, it's a very fair point that you make. Can I just rewind a little bit because we're going to talk about the failures in a little bit, but can I just go back to you um, as a marketer? Because I think you've got a really, really interesting skill set that kind of arrived into the no-code space having you know, got quite a lot of experience in marketing. So can I, can I just ask you about that and your experience with marketing that, that eventually led you to find Webflow? Because I believe you were trying to spin up web um, landing pages and that's kind of where Webflow came in. Mm -hmm. So after university, I joined this entrepreneurial boot camp and I got teamed up with two developers. So I had to develop a skill set that would complement what they were doing. And so sales and marketing was like the natural area to drift towards. And so um, I started mostly doing business development at the beginning, but I always felt that I wanted to learn a technical skill because a lot of the work that developers were doing was incredibly technical, sitting at a computer, coding things up. And so I wanted to develop, develop a skill set where I could actually show tangible results in terms of deliverables, you know, like things that I created. And so I decided to learn um, digital marketing. And so I um, spent a lot of time learning Facebook ads. And that was what I ended up specializing in for 
really long time. And then um, as I got into freelancing, um, I really doubled down on Facebook ads specifically. Um, I started off creating Facebook ads in the co-working space niche. Then I um, started working with... Um, you know, I worked with the biggest ski field in New Zealand and then I did a lot of, um, I don't know how this happened, but like a lot of sports events related um, marketing. And so I really just, um, yeah, started off with Facebook ads and then basically honed my skill set by freelancing on for different companies that were trying to sell online. And that's also that skill set really came into helping you grow the unicorn factory when you eventually set that up as well, wasn't it? So that um, you could attract more and more um, jobs to there and also freelancers became aware of it through that as well. Is that right? Yeah. So um, one thing that I started to realize with my Facebook ads and the more time I spent um you know, refining my skill set is that, you know, Facebook ads is just a piece in the puzzle. If you really want to get results that you need to kind of be able to influence every part of the user journey. And obviously the website is a big part of that. Now, prior to getting into Facebook ads, I tried WordPress. I tried all those things, but nothing really stuck. But I was kind of, um, I kind of wanted to really figure out how I could at the very least build landing pages because obviously campaign landing pages are key for Facebook ads campaigns. And oftentimes the clients that I work with didn't have any in-house talent that could basically build landing pages for me. So it was really up to me to figure it out. And that is really how I stumbled into the Webflow world. Um, and as soon as I started to learn how to build build a basic landing page. Um, I, I went through a very similar journey where I kind of went down the Webflow rabbit hole and I discovered the CMS and then I came across that blog post. And so um, one of the ways that I find I learn best is to actually just build a project and to kind of use that as my playground to experiment with different things. And um, I actually made that the unicorn factory. So uh, I, I had the option between um, learning how to build my own portfolio website or to potentially just build a directory of freelancers. And at the time I was working in a co-working space where um, there were a lot of businesses that would need freelancers. So I figured, you know, I could just create this and just promote it in that co-working space that I was in. And so um, ultimately how it all played out was I started working on it. I recruited a few friends to be on the site. And um, before you knew it, like I had eight freelancers on there and I'd go around the co-working space promoting my Facebook ad services. And then um, people started talking about it and a few more freelancers added. And now it's kind of grown into what it is now. So it's quite funny how it kind of evolved over time. It's so crazy how like it organically became what it is today though. Like it, de you didn't set out with like, I'm going to build the largest job board in New Zealand. Like that was not your intention. It was like, I want to get freelance work. So I'm going to create this website and drive traffic and that's going to create awareness in the co-working space. And, mm -hmm. but it was mainly for um, your Facebook ad freelance work, right? Like you weren't offering web design or, or web building, were you? Correct. Yeah. I mean, I was so uncomfortable about offering that as a service, even for, for like quite a long time, even after we had like hundreds of people on the Unicorn Factory only because I didn't never consider myself like a web designer or web developer. I had the, I had a lot of confidence in my Facebook advertising skills because um, Facebook ads have a really good feedback loop where you can actually see, hey, this is the return on ad spend. And so you can immediately see, oh, wow, I'm actually delivering great results for a client. But, you know, like design is a very uh, subjective thing and I was always like nah, I'm not a designer you know even nowadays I'm kind of like I'm not that great at designing um I think I can get like the basics of UX up and running and obviously with like tools like Reloom and stuff like that it's all a little bit easier to get like the UX side of things better um but I would not offer that as a service um eventually I did but um when I started the Unicorn Factory it was just I'm going to use this to get more Facebook ad clients it's so crazy okay can we just circle back to you building this as your first website because in my head I'm like if you want to get clients you need a portfolio and what you did is thought everyone's got a portfolio and some of them aren't even getting clients so mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go like completely left field and and was that successful or like kind of you know it's just so different from like what generally people would say if you were to try to get clients. Do you see what I'm saying? 
A hundred percent. I mean, like the thing about it is, is like I don't, I didn't think I would stand the chance competing against agencies. It's not even like a, uh, it's not even competing against other freelancers. I mean, I thought it would be super difficult for me to um, create my own portfolio website and then go and present it on par with what um, you know some of the other agencies are doing. A uh, few reasons for that. Number one, I don't think that I have the visual uh, design skills that I think you need in order to compete with some of those people who are like super legit. Um, obviously, um, and, and it was really, and also after just talking to people um, that I, other freelancers, businesses, I just realized that a majority of the time people just want choice. And so that kind of played into it as well. It's like, well, here, I'm not really trying to sell my services. I'm trying to present options to potential problems that they have. And then hopefully that will lead to them reaching out to me. But ultimately we had like Shopify people on there and it's really kind of just options for people. Um, and so that was kind of, the idea behind it, that was kind of what I thought would work. With that being said, I had no idea if it was going to work or not. It just luckily ended up turning out to be something that worked because our SEO started to kick in. Having all of those freelancers on there was a huge advantage in terms of ranking well on Google for terms like freelance logo designer, freelance web designer. And so eventually it just got to the top of Google and that kind of is when like everything started to like roll naturally. Yeah, it's crazy. And I guess you got backlinks from all these different freelancers who are on the co-working space. And so, so, and I guess it was an amazing case study for your Facebook ads as well. I mean, as a freelancer, you know, if you have a business that is working, then other business people are going to be like, well, he's obviously not just a guy who's dicking around on YouTube. Like he knows his stuff. He's got a serious, he's top of Google. Like he must, let's, you know, hire this guy. Um, mm -hmm. which is which is genius so a that but also also um because i was um kind of connecting all these freelancers to businesses i was also getting really great insights from businesses as to why they wouldn't hire certain types of freelancers why they wouldn't reach out to certain types of freelancers because um if they, they would give me honest feedback they they'd never like um, they'd never tell the freelancers directly because they're always worried about hurting their feelings and stuff like that. But they'd tell me why they would be like, oh, we didn't reach out to this person for this, this, and this reason. Um, we checked out their like, website and it didn't work, all those kind of things. And so I was able to basically create a checklist of things that I had to do on my profile in order to put myself in the best possible position. And I was able to learn a lot faster because I was able to do it for an entire collection of freelancers. And that really put me in a good spot pretty fast and i started sharing all that information with other freelancers as well um and yeah that kind of improved you know the whole client freelancer relationship and engagement on the site pretty fast yeah and i guess you kind of had this like beautiful network of not only clients but then also you know like a network of freelancers that you could match them with and 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 grow that so then you were like hold on why am i freelancing like I'm actually really good at this whole job board thing. Mm -hmm. And then member stack came in and you were like, oh my God, I can, I can actually turn this into a business. Is that kind of how it organically happened or am I completely oversimplifying this story? Uh, so it, it took me a long time after monetization to get off the whole freelancing thing. Um, I mean, uh, when I started to monetize the unicorn factory, which was, uh, so I had a friend who I had a revenue share agreement with, which um, was like a, which was awesome for like making revenue pretty much immediately. But then member stack came out and I started to charge membership fee, but it, it, it was, it took me a while to get it up and running. And so um, basically a rule that I set myself was um, my, my goal is to have um, between four to five clients at any given time. So I roughly want to make about 10K a month. And so the rule that I set myself was for every 2K a monthly recurring revenue that I made, I could basically drop a client and focus on that time on the unicorn factory. Um, and that's kind of how I approached it until I got to the point where, um, yeah, I basically stopped doing um, freelance work. But that took a long time. So it, it wasn't something that happened from like one day to the other. It took me a few years to get to that point. Um, but by the time I decided to stop freelancing, I'd also up my rates. And I also switched from Facebook ads to no code stuff, which um, was a lot more profitable for me as a freelancer. And so, yeah. Um, but eventually, yeah, the Unicorn Factory basically paid for me to um, not freelance, I suppose. Yeah. 
I think that's a really important point to say because just in case anyone's like really inspired by this story and is like, right, I'm going to stop freelancing and I'm just going to build a job board or build a marketplace. <clears throat> you have been spending years building up those relationships, years building up client relationships, but also, you know, work relationships with freelancers. And it, you were still not, you know, quitting freelancing at that point. And I think that's a really important point to say, because so many people are like, yeah, I'll freelance for a bit and then I'm just going to jump ship. It's like, no, it, it takes a while. And were there were there times when you were like, because 10K a month, I mean, I don't know what how you spend. Maybe you buy Gucci and Versace and whatever. But like, you must, like, you could have probably quit freelancing earlier than you did. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So again, you know, like my goal was always 10K a month. There were, I, I'm not trying to say that it was like immediately 10K a month. There'd be like months where I'd make like four grand and then months where I'd make like 12 grand and a lot of fluctuation. It's not like a steady ship. So, um, that that is the first part of it. Sorry, can you just repeat what the question was? Yeah, sorry, I rambled there. Did you want to quit freelancing earlier than you did? Um, no, I actually enjoy working with clients. So I even now I don't really completely rule it out anymore. But I just don't jump on the tools that much anymore because it's just not the best use of my time. But um, I I I enjoy working with um people and um also you know it actually gives me like a good kind of like change of scenery when i'm kind of stuck in the weeds a bit uh, i recently um helped some guys out in canada who are building some super advanced webflow e-commerce automation and i was just super keen to a um you know work with them because typically i just work by myself they um are super creative guys and i thought it was a good opportunity for me to actually also like build my network and kind of work with people who are super talented at what they're doing and so i worked on with them for like a four month contract and uh, no, a four week contract and it's and it wasn't something that i had to do it was just more something that i was like you know this is like a good opportunity so i think uh in regards to my freelancing i've never really been like i don't want to do this anymore but I have definitely uh, put myself in a position where I can pick and choose what I work on a lot more. So if I don't absolutely love the idea of it, um, I just don't have to do it anymore, which is kind of the key thing that I wanted to work towards. But I honestly never, ever rule it out. Like, because you never even, like one of the things that I've just learned over, over like, you know, running my own business for the last few years is you never know. Like someone might hit you up. It might not necessarily be, um, you know, what you what's in your mind in terms of what you want to do with your time right now, but it might just be a huge opportunity. And I like to just keep my options open. So yeah. So I'd say I don't really freelance now. I don't jump on tools, but I still occasionally do consulting for people. I, and so I suppose in that sense, I still kind of do that a bit. Yeah. But it's great that you've got the choice to, to decide, to decide how you spend your day. And on, on that note, I mean, what is the average day for you right now? I mean, there's content creation. There's obviously running the Unicorn Factory. But, you know, what, what's your average day looking like? Yeah. So for the last month, I have done absolutely nothing. <laughs> Just by <laughs> being overseas in New Zealand. This was actually the first holiday since I've started working for myself where... I just did nothing and I didn't feel a little bit bad about it. In the past, whenever I've taken time off, I've always been like, oh, you kind of need to like, you need to like do something. You need to do something to feel like you're pushing things along. But this was the first time where I felt super comfortable about where I am with my business. I felt super relaxed about just being able to take time off, not even think about things and know that I can return to it and things will be all good. And so that was pretty much my last month. Um, and, but now, in terms of my focus, um, so that that's shifted recently. Um, in the, back in the day, I think like a traditional week would probably be a split of like 20% Unicorn Factory stuff, which is mostly maintenance, coasting. You know, I don't really need to do that much on the Unicorn Factory because it's pretty much all automated. Then I would split my time between my courses and my consulting stuff and YouTube content creation. So there was probably like an 80-20 split between the YouTube and the course stuff and then the Unicorn Factory. I'm now switching that around. So now my focus is right back to the Unicorn Factory. Um, the Unicorn Factory has grown a lot. Um, 
And I've kind of always treated the unicorn factory as a little bit of a side hustle. I mean, like it's obviously not a side hustle anymore. It's a, a reason. It's a business. A, a business that's doing really well. But I've always kind of had like a little bit of an attitude about like let's just you know because I started it not really with like a plan of it being a business. I've always kind of kept that going. But um, I, I caught up with some friends who do really well in business and I was talking about, you know, business. And one of the key things that I took away from some of those conversations is that I've got a huge opportunity with the unicorn factory that I should just take advantage of. And so uh, what I've decided to do and what I'm committing to now is to basically focus 80% of my time and energy for the foreseeable future on the unicorn factory and just make that amazing scale it into a few other countries, at least focus on Canada for now and see how far I can actually take it so that I don't end up in a situation in a few years where I look back on it and go, what if I would have tried a bit harder on it? And so that is kind of where I am with things now. So at the moment, four out of five days in the week i'm pretty much like focused on unicorn factory stuff the other day i work with some of the people that i do my courses and stuff with do a bit of youtube stuff all that kind of stuff yeah awesome and it sounds like there's this kind of um flywheel effect of you know courses and then you're learning from a little bit of consultancy and client work and then that feeds into, um, you know, the YouTube content that you create. And then it kind of just gets faster and faster. But now you're like, hold on, Unicorn Factory needs to be a way bigger focus in my life. And that sounds like you're going to double down on that. So exciting times. Um, okay, I could talk to you forever about all of this kind of stuff. But for the sake of our guests, we need to jump into your failures because they are chomping at the bit to realize where you've messed up. It doesn't sound like you have messed up that much, but tell me about failure number one, not pulling the plug on your first startup, Hatcher, sooner. Yeah, so I I chose that one because um, with all of the failures that I'm going to talk about, I don't really consider them failures. I kind of consider them more like low points throughout my journey of working for myself. And and the first point uh, where I feel like I kind of hit like a a real low point in my life at the time was um, when I um, when at the first startup that I worked on called Hatcher kind of burnt to the ground a bit. Um, And so the long, so just the long story short, after university, I was struggling to find jobs. Um, I was like a real C type student and C's get degrees, but like you struggle to like get jobs. And so um, I, I was feeling really down about myself because I kind of felt like I had done what I was supposed to do, go to university, get a degree, and then I'll go out into the workforce and get my job. But because I never really cared about university as much, or I never tried as much, um, or I never really tried to like get really good grades, I found myself in a position where I couldn't get jobs. And so the way that I dealt with that was I joined an entrepreneurial boot camp thing because someone said to me, you know, like put something entrepreneurial on there because that um, is something that employers love seeing in your um, CV and it will increase the chances of you getting interviews. And essentially it's just a numbers game. So I joined this program and we, I got paired up with these guys who are developers and I started this startup called Hatcher, which is basically, uh, was an app that helped you find food and drink deals uh, in my hometown in Wellington. Again, it was like a marketplace as well where restaurants and bars could basically list their promos on our thing. Like a classic app that like first time entrepreneurs, students kind of create. And when we created it um, at the start, the whole point of it was to create like a PowerPoint presentation. So I've just got something that I can smash on my CV and so I can move on with this. But I actually just realized that I loved it. I loved uh, the idea of coming up with things, putting it out there. And as soon as I got enthusiastic about it, a lot of people that we were around saw that enthusiasm and they started supporting us. And so I feel like I derived a lot of my confidence from this business. So like me working on this suddenly turned me in from someone who was struggling to find a job to this tech startup entrepreneur. And I was like, it made me feel really good about myself. And so um, we were like pretty new to business. Like to be honest, we thought we had it all figured it out, but like in hindsight, we didn't know shit. And so um Basically, we got to the point where we had built 
an Android app, an iOS app. We have built like this fancy customer dashboard with analytics and all that kind of stuff, but we were barely making money. And the thing is this, the writing was on the wall for a very, very long time. We hadn't really done like good customer research. We hadn't really validated that there are people out there who are going to be willing to pay us for it. You know, sometimes I look back and feel like we just made some pretty silly rookie mistakes because we, you know, we were too sure of what we were doing. Um, and ultimately it got to the point where everyone started like running out of money and like the emotional toll and the mental toll that like not making a lot of money um, was taking on you was kind of getting to everyone. And so eventually we pulled the plug. But so the, the, the two developers eventually just got jobs, but I hung on to this thing for like another few months um, just because I was so attached to the business because I identified so much with the business. I pretty much derived all of my self-worth from this business that I just couldn't let it go because I thought that if I, if I stop this, this is the end of me. I'm like right back to where I started. And so what I did was, I, I, I unnecessarily dragged out the pulling of the plug in order to avoid dealing with the fact that this is, didn't work out the way I hoped it was going to work out. And I learned so much about business doing that. I, I, I mostly learned about what not to do, how to be a bit more strategic on all those kind of things. But when I look back, I feel like I could have learned those lessons a lot faster and I should have also just pulled the pin and realize that, you know, even though this chapter might may come to an end, it's really just the beginning of the next chapter. And yeah, so I'd probably say that the biggest regret slash failure in that situation was that I just did not pull the plug sooner so that I could move on to the next thing, which eventually turned into freelancing and then the unicorn factory. Wow. Okay. A lot to unpick there. So, I mean, it's interesting that you saw yourself as a C student by virtue of, of being, uh, well, I don't know if it's fair to say that you were a C student, but I think so much of the time at school you and uni, you kind of, you're defined very um, like objectively, like if you don't get, you know, a 70 plus, you're not getting a first. If you don't get between 60 and 70, you're getting, you know, a two one or whatever the kind of system is in, in your country. And, and I think then you see yourself as that person, as an adult, when actually life, luckily, thank God, it doesn't work like school, but you carried mm -hmm. that into your adulthood. And then when this um, entrepreneurial uh, venture started you were like this is who i am finally i found out what i'm meant to be doing this is my purpose i can confidently tell adults that i am running my own business and yeah. then to you know carry that on even though the, the two developers left which i imagine were pretty important considering your business was an app that mm -hmm. must have been so difficult for you and uh god i i can't really imagine that so so after that stopped, you must have felt pretty low, pretty. Yeah. I mean, how did you even kind of start the next thing when that chapter closed, even though you didn't really realize that was a chapter closing, you thought it was just the end? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was like a bit messy. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> like I had burnt out 100%. And at the time, I didn't even really know what being burnt out meant. There was a realization I made afterwards. And the thing is, is like all of the stress and uncertainty about the business had such a negative effect in every other area of my life. For example, I started being super unhealthy and, you know, like I gained a lot of weight and didn't sleep well, all those kind of things. Like I had really allowed that startup idea to take everything from me. And so for me, before I jumped into the next thing there was really just a period of recovery you know mm -hmm. and that was incredibly hard because even once you say hey look even like even though you say okay look it's time to like recover a bit there's still like a certain period of time where your mind is trying to get you back into it it's telling you no like, just keep going just keep going and blah 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 you know 
And so it really took me a period for me to just recover, I would, I would say, and just like get my priorities straight a bit. And so for me, my priorities were um, health, like get in good shape again, get my mental health wired down. And I was very lucky because um, I've got a great family. I've got like a good support network. So I actually spent a bit of time with my mum. Like I went up to where my mum lives and I just stayed there, which, you know, was crushing at the beginning as well because I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, how am I, how am I like this old, you know, and I'm going for like, the tech startup guy and now i'm like back living at my friggin' mother's house this is a complete and utter disaster but i honestly needed that time to recover i needed like a little bit of a break where i had like no obligations i could just like you know focus on getting healthy again i could stop eating junk food for a moment and like um you know just kind of get a bit healthy again and then you know it didn't even take that long, maybe like three, three ish weeks in, I was like starting to feel good again. I started to feel healthy. I started to sleep better. I started to stop being so down about the whole situation. And that's when I realized, look, I'm ready now to like get back on the horse and I know I can do it. I just need to be more practical about it. I need to change my priorities. I know now what's important, what I should be working towards. And so I decided, you know what? If I, no matter what I do when I go back to it, I am not going to sacrifice my health, my physical or mental health. I am not going. I'm not willing to make any sacrifices in terms of making money. So I'm not going to do the whole. I, I'll eat ramen noodles for like three months to hopefully eventually become super rich. I was like, we're just going to focus on like adding value to businesses, charging a fair rate and making sure that what I'm doing is enjoyable and that it's allowing me to kind of live a good, healthy lifestyle. And that's what I did. As soon as I like have made my list of things that are important to me, I packed up, went back to Wellington, moved into my flat and next day returned to the co-working space. And I was like, you know what? I am going to get on this freelancing train. I'm going to get, I'm going to start working for myself again and I'm going to make this work because I know I can do it. And yeah, it worked. I'm feeling pumped. I'm feeling pumped <laughs> right now. It sounds like you just, you learned that you needed to do the basics well and, yeah. and, and then also disassociate your self-worth from your job. Um, because I think a lot of freelancers listening right now might be really resonating with that, that it's kind of like a, there's a pressure to be kind of a this like hustle culture where you, you know, like it, it only it only stops when you quit or whatever. And actually, you yeah. learn that you need to you need to know when enough is enough for yourself <laughs> and, and put yourself first over your work. Is that fair? A hundred percent. And I also got caught up in the hustle culture thing, you know, like I, I got caught up in the whole, you know, raising money thing, you know, where like, that's the only way you can do it. And so, um, you know, there's so much noise and advice from the outside. And especially when you don't know, when you're a little bit unsure about what you should be doing, you're a lot more, um, like you're more likely to like listen to what someone has to say and kind of take it as the gospel. And so it can lead you astray. Um, but, you know, as soon as you, uh, one of the things I realized was like a lot of the struggles and challenges that I had, it pretty much everyone else had. And as soon as I started opening up about it with friends who were in similar positions, I actually just realized, well, this is actually very similar for all of us. And as soon as you see that, hey, look, this person who is like great at this struggles with the exact same things. It actually kind of makes you feel a little bit good about yourself because you don't feel like, you, you know, you don't feel like you're screwing up or you're stupid or whatever it may be. And so I just surrounded myself with people who were kind of going through a similar journey, had different challenges and would just run things by each other. And I feel like that really put things in perspective. I also started to realize, you know, I think I, I think I started to realize it a lot more when I started creating YouTube content is like, you know, the stuff that you see on social media is designed to evoke a reaction. And so when you create content, you realize that a lot more because you look at like your retention graphs and your click through rates and all that kind of stuff. And you just realize that a lot of the stuff and um, that is put out there and the way it's told um, or delivered 
is designed to make you feel like you're not doing a good enough job or to make it sound like the solution to your, all your problems is super simple, but it's not. And I think um, adding that perspective made me relax a lot more, made me kind of like breathe and kind of enjoy the journey of figuring things out. And that just allowed me to kind of stay on track with what I wanted to do. And yeah, that I think has like been a key thing to me kind of making progress with what all the different things that I'm working on. And so, yeah. Going slow, not recognizing that media tries to make you feel like a piece of shit. And so just having that context as you, you know, consume social media, which naturally we all do, um, sounds like a really, really healthy thing to realize. And it's easy to say, but it's harder to do though. But it sounds like you've kind of, you've got like a really, really clear idea of when to, um, yeah, when to say enough is enough. Tell me about failure number two then, splitting your time between doing Facebook ads and no code as a freelancer. Yeah. So again, here, this is just a, a learning um, for me personally, which was, you know, after I did, went and spoke at the no code conference, in um san francisco in 2019 all these people started getting in touch with me asking me if i can like help people with you know um you know help them set up their own marketplace do courses consulting and just like opportunities flew my way um but throughout that entire period i i wasn't really willing to like commit to it even though it looked like a super promising opportunity. So I'd always like to hedge my bets a little bit by also doing Facebook ad stuff and then kind of like doing a little bit of um, doing a little bit of like no code stuff here and there. When in reality, I could have just like committed to the no code stuff earlier and it would have probably, you know, helped me on my career trajectory a lot faster. But I was always hedging my bets because there was a certain level of concern that if I um, if I abandon the Facebook thing that's working out for me and I just go all in on the no code stuff that I could end up in a situation where everything comes crumbling back down again. And so I feel like it would have been good. Uh, it would have been a good decision to earlier just be like, no more of this Facebook ad stuff. Let's just focus on the no code stuff. But with that being said, you know, um, I kind of naturally gravitated towards just focusing on all of the no code stuff eventually anyway, because I was just making more money, but I kind of feel like I could have done it a little bit earlier, but yeah. But I mean, having said that though, like we said in the intro, I mean, you're, you're a no code weapon, you know, and part of the reason for that, I think is because you also know marketing, like you also think about the psychology behind user decision-making and you're not just, you know, spinning up stuff for the sake of it, right? And I and I think, um, you know, to your credit, like you were doing both at the same time, probably because not just necessarily because of that fear-based thing, but also maybe because you were just like, I'm good at both. I enjoy both. Mm. And they kind of go hand in hand to a certain extent. Like, you know, like you said at the start of this with marketing, you know, you're driving traffic to a landing page. Well, that landing page is needs to be built on, you know, there's like Facebook, Facebook ads times websites. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I mean, like at the end of the day, I don't think that that's like a particularly big one. I feel like, um, I can't remember what I said was like number three. Um, but I feel like, um, it kind of, Oh, actually I do remember it kind of ties into this is that hedging your bets too much out of fear can sometimes lead to you doing a lot of things a little bit, but nothing very great. And so um, when I, you know, uh, when I came back here, I feel like all of the things that I've done with the Unicorn Factory has always been a little bit less than I could have done. And this is not mm. me being hard on myself. I feel like I've done really, really well on the Unicorn Factory. Like um, I feel like I've taken it to like quite a good place. But if I'm being honest here, I have not treated it very much like, hey, this is like my thing. I don't even tell people it is my main thing because Wait, there's always... What? what do yeah, you because, tell people uh, your main thing? Well, I kind of don't even really know what to tell people what my main thing is, but it's like, you know, 
when people ask me, I just go like, I run the unicorn factory and I also do like no co consulting, but it's never like just a pure focus on the unicorn factory. And so I kind of feel like it's just like an, a, a tendency to like want to hedge your bets a little bit by taking on a lot of different things, which I think is a mistake now, you know, um, because it kind of just gets in the way of, um, you know, taking full advantage of the things that you're doing very well already. Yeah. I think there's, it, it's a difficult one though, isn't it? Because on the one hand, I've heard people talk about spreading their surface area for luck. So, mm -hmm. you know, having different skill sets um, or maybe, you know, doing various different things and kind of seeing what takes off or seeing, you know, where, follow your nose and see where it goes. Right. And then on the other hand, like you say, I mean, if you hedge your bets too much, if you try and spread your time and attention to too many different places, then naturally you're not going to be able to do anything that well. Um, I've heard Chris Doe talk about this T shape where you have like a variety of different skills, but one skill is your real um, kind of depth. And, and that's where you're really talented. I don't know if that resonates with you. Yeah, for sure. I actually heard that example as well. I think it's actually how Google approaches hiring people. They, the, in the context of marketing, they hire what's called T-shaped marketers, which is like a real good broad understanding of a lot of different areas, but then a specialist in a particular area. It's kind of interesting, um, you know, um, I, the decisions that I've made up until this point have been very good because it has helped me develop a, a very broad skill set. So like marketing stuff, sales stuff, even just like being able to run my own business has given me incredibly useful insights into just like, you know, accounting, you know, mm -hmm. all the stuff that I studied, I studied at university and just learned in textbooks, I never really understood until I actually did it on my own business. And so I definitely think it's useful. I think it is more, it's not even so much about the skills. It's more about uh, deciding what opportunities to pursue. And I kind of feel like oftentimes when you find yourself in a situation where you chase too many opportunities, you don't actually get the opportunity to really excel with the skill set that you have built over time because you're constantly constantly stopping and starting stopping and starting with a whole bunch of different things and so yeah that's kind of how i kind of, uh, how i look at it now so yeah no that's a really good way of looking at it so you're saying that it's not so much uh spreading your luck that's wrong it's that you need to go in on something to actually follow it through to for, for it to realize your full potential to a certain extent um which which makes a lot of sense in the context of that for web flowers that might be listening i feel like web flowers is such a general term now i'm kind of like mm -hmm. so wait are you a marketer are you a developer are you a designer that's coming into the space um do you think that web flowers should be focusing on because everyone talks about niching and I, I, mm -hmm. I kind of feel like the word niching is just so such a blanket statement, which I'm not sure is that helpful for web flowers that are starting out in the space. What, what are your thoughts on niching? Do you think that web flowers should niche? And if so, how niche? And, um, you know, in the context of being such a good generalist, how do you see it? So I think when people think of niching, they think in terms of giving themselves a competitive advantage in the market. But I actually think the true benefit of niching is that it allows you to focus. So um, I've got, you know, I've got like some friends who do really well in the Webflow space because they do a particular thing that they kind of self-identify as. They kind of self-identify as their own niche. Now, the market might not necessarily see that as their niche, um, but uh, an example of that is Nikolai, who has a YouTube Nikolai channel ben. where he, yeah. he, he, he is, his focus is a lot around Webflow templates, you know? So like a lot of the content that he does is about like has his template stuff. And so he is technically to the market, a Webflow person. So a lot of his clients don't see him as the Webflow template person. They see him as like a Webflow design and developer, but because he identifies more in that particular niche, it allows him to focus more. And I actually feel like having more focus in that sense allows you to move faster because you don't need to constantly think about, oh, what should I do next? What should I do next? Because you already have defined that tunnel that you're going to go down. And so when it, so. In summary, when it comes to niching, I, I do think that obviously the advantages to niching down and positioning yourself to the market as someone, I feel like if you look at what, you know, uh, for example, Black Peak does with Wiz, they are like 
the whiz developers you know that will give you a huge edge in the market but i think if you are a webflow developer listening to this and you are thinking about how can i stand out i would pick a particular area that you can focus on and use that kind of as the channel that you go down and you'll see that you'll pick up people from all sorts of other areas as well just by default awesome advice there so you're saying don't necessarily niche um just because there's a particularly lucrative industry or something like i've seen people be like I am the web flower for dentists or whatever. And you're saying, yeah. no, that's you're not necessarily niching for other people to understand what you do. You're, you're niching for you to understand what you do, for you to not spend time trying to work out what you're doing. And by virtue of doing that, you're naturally going to attract that type of work into your life. Exactly. So yeah. like example of the web flow for dentist person, ultimately, if you like, wake up tomorrow and you decide I'm going to become the web flow for dentist person, like no dentist knows who you are. Okay. You're still going to have to go out there and build awareness around what you're doing, but at least now, you know, okay, if I'm going to create a list of people that I'm going to reach out to by email, well, now, you know, what's well, dentists that I should focus on. And let's say, for example, you want to build an example portfolio. Now, you know, well, I'm not just going to create like random web flow sites. I'm going to create examples of websites that might appeal to dentists. And so really what it does is it focuses you in on what you should be doing. And, you know, I think, you know, that, that's kind of how I see it, you know, like as soon as you start promoting, I, I know people have done this for real estate, you know, and sometimes it works. Sometimes, you know, it's a little bit of a hard push because a particular area is already kind of saturated. But I think it's a great place to get started. Pick something that you want to focus on, ideally something that you're interested in. So if you're not interested in dentists, in dentistry, or you don't have an in with dentist, with different dentists, maybe like pick something that is a bit more enjoyable because, you know, just niching because you think that there's a huge financial opportunity. It's hard to last long in those types of industries. So yeah, I kind of feel like niching super valuable for to help you focus on what you should do, but there's always the flexibility to change it over time. And I also think it's important to, to say there that you're not just using the word niche for industries as well. You're actually saying, you know, Black Pete folks on Wiz, right? Mm -hmm. That's a particular part of, um, well, I guess it's a, not really a part of Webflow, but it's something that, um, you know, someone that's looking to build their website with Webflow, you know, you can facilitate a kind of, um, you know, massive level up for Webflow projects. So niching is not just about a particular industry. It might be a particular service that you offer within the Webflow space, um, yep. which I think is important as well. Yeah, I actually, at the Webflow, uh, at the Unicorn Factory conference, I actually came across a Webflow developer and they were like, hey, how can I like stand out from everyone else? And I said to them, I actually recently hired a Webflow developer solely because they knew how to do client first. So, you know, there's like another way that you can stand out, you know, um, in the market. You can be like, hey, I am specialized in this particular thing. Like, If you know how to use animations real well, like mm. highlight that, you know. Um, yeah. If you know like tricks with custom code highlight that because those yeah. are the things that will give you an edge in the market you just need to make sure that people find out about it and there's um, a guy called tony seats who is he is specifically a white label webflow developer for agencies which i think is such an interesting kind of because he's instantly just saying look i don't work with um you know other clients that are approaching me so you're instantly just saying this is not for me but if you are an agency owner who's looking for someone to, you know, bust out projects who's really proficient, that's me. Um, and he's he's absolutely snowed under with work. So I just think it's yeah, it's it's really important to to highlight that because I think a lot of people think niching is what's a lucrative niche? Okay, law. I'm gonna do websites for lawyers. And it's like, hold the phone there, buddy. You you know, you don't need to think as kind of uh, linearly as that. Tell me about failure number three. I'm going to mm -hmm. use another, you sent me a whole list and, and I think this one I really want to talk about. Not using a design system and overriding styles whenever I jump back into Webflow after a period of time. 
I mean, I thought because this is like web flail, I should throw some good like web flow <laughs> ones in there or some good no code failures because I've had some. I, I consider these things more PSAs than um, admission of failures. But the first one was, oh, this, you, you find these things out by trial and error. Like even just thinking back at it, it just kind of makes me cry a bit. But, um, you know, like when I set up the Unicorn Factory, I connected a lot of workflows through Zapier to the Webflow CMS. And then one day I painfully realized that if you back up a Webflow, C, uh, a Webflow project, um, the CMS changes all its collection items and it essentially breaks every single workflow that you've got set up. So that's PSA number one. If your workflows are connected to your Webflow projects, do not back them up. Um, there are ways around it, um, but that can break your workflow. So that's number one. Number two, I don't know which Webflow developer hasn't experienced this, but like I was like, because I never really considered myself a designer, um, I would always just kind of like just jump in there and kind of just see what happens. And I would always run into issues where I'd like override styles because I didn't have like good class naming conventions. So like I would like work on a project. It would all be nice and orderly. Then I'd take like a two, three week break and I'd completely forget why I structured it in a certain way or why I named the class in a certain way. So I'd try to make a change. I'd change like the height of an element. And then before you know it, like I go on other pages and it's all misaligned because I had accidentally overwritten styles. And so one thing that really worked for me with that was actually just using a design system. So I used the client first one or the Reloom one, whatever comes. I, I pretty much just use like Reloom now as like my project starters. Um, and so they've got a really good style guide. So I feel like if you're just getting started with Webflow, um, you know, adopting good habits around using style guides, consistent class naming conventions will put you in a real good spot, especially because now I can actually comfortably outsource large parts of my Webflow development work because I use client first. And I know that someone who is experienced with client first can come in, and make changes. And so I've been working with this real cool dude um, in the Netherlands who just comes in, he's a real good designer, he knows what he's doing in Webflow, so he just comes in and he can adapt it. Whenever I like log back into the project, I know exactly what's going on. But again, you know, it's not really like a failure, it's more like a, a learning, um, but still a good one to kind of know if you're getting into the Webflow space. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely important to highlight because I think, um, yeah, I mean, if we were to talk about just failures with Webflow on Webflow, I mean, we would need way more than three for every single person that comes on this on this show because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you're just learning learning the ropes. But it's good to think as someone that's so into automations um, that, you know, with client sites, if you if a client's like, hey, can you, you know, come in and we restore the website because we've messed it up and we need you to restore it then yeah, all of those links uh, may be in trouble. So just consider that. Um, definitely an important one to talk about. Connor, are you ready for your most difficult question so far? Okay. What is your next failure going to be? Hmm. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> huh. Well, I'm 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 going to be making some upgrades to the Unicorn Factory, which is like walking a tightrope every single time I do something. I mean, stuff breaks all the time. And, you know, the thing about it is, is I test in production. So, you know, actually, one of the things that happened recently is I emailed like 6,000 businesses accidentally telling them that they have new freelancers on their shortlist. And that was because I accidentally forgot to turn off one of the automations. So, you know, stuff like that is going to happen on the regular. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm never too worried about things. I mean, like, if I'm being completely honest, like, things go up and down all the time. You have, like, moments where you feel like things are not going that well. I'm not overly phased about it now. I feel like the philosophy that I've developed around my business is that, like, you're going to have, on average, like, highs and lows. And whenever I hit those lows, I can kind of just accept now that it's part of that experience. And it's really like, I, I kind of feel very, very lucky to be able to do what I do. So I don't take like things going wrong or, you know, you know, things, you know, just breaking stuff as 
personally anymore i'm kind of a bit more like oh yeah it's just like part of the fun i suppose um so i couldn't tell you i'll let you know if it's a good one i'll let you know <laughs> yeah i hope so and uh where can people find you if they want to ask you anything about this episode or anything else uh twitter connor uh, finlayson connor youtube connor finlayson just feel free and also on my website connor you can hit me up send me a message along with all those other people who are pitching me their ai tools so <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah feel free to reach out connor it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for sharing so vulnerably next week we're gonna have ran segal on the podcast Whoa. very excited yeah we got some that big guests awesome. coming through you then ran awesome so i love excited. it excited but yeah thanks so much connor for coming on and sharing so vulnerably and best of luck thanks for having me see ya <laughs>